let's start. Hello, this is Tyler Crone with the 36th District Democrats. We're delighted to be interviewing Lisa Rivera-Smith for school board director position two. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you and good morning. Thank you all for this opportunity to introduce myself uh, to your membership and to ask for your endorsement. Um, as you said, I am Lisa Rivera-Smith. I am running for re-election to the Seattle Public School Board of Directors for position two. Um, I was first elected to this position in November 2019, and it has been my honor to represent not just the students, families, and staff of District 2, but the entire city. As board directors, we represent the entire city in the work we do. Um, well, a little back to about myself, I feel like I've gotten to know um, your community and others very well in the last four years. Um, I am originally from California. I was the first in my family to attend college. I got a degree in journalism and a minor in ethics. I came to Seattle to work for the Seattle Times, um, fell in love with the city, uh, left a little bit and came back and have been uh, back subtly since 2007. I've been involved in um, the public school system as far as PTAs. I was president at Hamilton, started the PTSA at Lincoln High School when it reopened, and then went to school board and have, again, been honored to serve there ever since. Um, I said this in my questionnaire that I joked with people that uh, I told them it was going to be a sleep before years, and it definitely has not been. <laughs> it's, it's been everything that we couldn't have imagined. And I'm, I, again, it has, has been an honor to work with the uh, fellow, my fellow directors, uh, staff, and families to navigate our way through um, the challenges we've seen these last four years. And the pandemic obviously was the biggest, but we've also had to search for a superintendent. We've had um, a, catastrophically a school shooting. We've had, uh, clearly we're in a budget crisis, and we've had a couple um not so not so uh, favorable things happen in our district over the last few years. So it has been a challenge, but I've learned so much over these last four years. I really want to put that work to use to continue to serve this district. It's going to be another challenging four years. I, I think that goes without saying. I'm never going to joke again that it's sleepy because it's not. It is a lot of work, but it's important work. And again, I would be honored to be reelected to continue that good work. Thank you. The first question this morning will be asked by Jeremy. Over to you, Jeremy. Um, as a school board director, oh, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, can somebody else make sure to start the timer? I'm, I'm asking a question. Um, as a school board director, name name some issues or situations, or not yet, um, where you feel you can make a difference and share an example from your own life where you've applied a specific skills toward an outcome. We are wanting to learn about your vision, what your strategic approach would be, and what your unique strength would be, would what unique strength you would bring to the role. Thank you. Um, as a former reporter, I think that I came into this job really with an emphasis on communication and transparency and and because I think that um, everybody's better off when they know what's going on, when they are in, when they are informed of the situation to the best of their ability to understand it. And so I've really tried to um, to follow that value in my work in these last four years. Um, I have been the. As board directors, we're not really given a, an official channel through which to communicate with the public. So I've tried to use social media. I have a director Facebook page, which I have posted my thoughts on issues at the time. I write these letters called Just Say Why. And they used to be 79 pages. I've tried to condense them <laughs> for readability, but but there's so much to share. I mean, that's just what it is. I, I, felt, I feel strongly that our constituency, our families, our staff, everybody, um, even if they don't agree with the decisions we're making, they feel better when they just know why. When we just say why, and we can explain ourselves in um, the fullest uh, to, to the fullest of our abilities, I think that that makes for not only more trusting relationships, but just again more informed people who know how to advocate for what they are not seeing from us. So I've worked with that towards definitely towards building relationships, um, not just with families and my fellow board directors, but with the staff of SPS, because we rely on them for to give us the information we need to make the decisions we need to make. Um, the board does not have its own dedicated staff that solely work for us. It's all superintendent staff through which we, you know, rely on and we appreciate for the good work they do. Um, so I've, again, built relationships with them. And I think I have really had the ability to just step back sometimes and look at the whole picture and focus on what we agree on versus what we don't agree on to try to bring this to a consensus and work towards improving. Thank you. 
The next prepared question this morning will be asked by Ginny. Over to you, Ginny. I don't hear her. Yeah. I think you might Pardon. be on mute. <laughs> I am the world's worst, seriously. <laughs> Enrollment in SPS has declined since 2020. What steps would you take to reverse this decline? Thank you. I think the first step is understanding the decline, correct? We need to understand what's happening. So uh, South Public Schools did hire consulting demographers to create a 10, 20, and 30 year projection for enrollment. So they also did an analysis as part of that to figure out what happened to enrollment so they could develop a model for what would happen in the future. They got data from the city of Seattle. And they looked at what they looked at two plus bedroom units because they made this assumption that that's what we need for family housing. And what they found is that if you look at, if you took a market rate price two plus bedroom unit and they looked at an affordable price two plus bedroom unit, the affordable one was 42 times more likely to yield a Seattle Public School student. So now the problem is that the bulk of the inventory that we've created in the recent history has been market rate. So essentially we have not built housing that produces Seattle Public School students. And that is one of the largest reasons why we have declining enrollment. We just haven't built the kind of housing families need. So what would I do? I would engage with the city about how do we do that? How do we build more affordable housing so that we can encourage families who are going to be public schools families to move to Seattle and stay with us? Thank you so much, Lisa. The next question this morning will be asked by Laura Marie. Over to you, Laura Marie. Good morning, Lisa. Uh, what is your vision of a well-resourced school and how do you practice equity and inclusion? No, that's a great question too. Um, let's start with the resource part of that equation, right? There's there's this misconception in, in not just Seattle, but the state that school funding is based on pro local property taxes. But in reality, the vast majority of our school funding comes from the state government and is based on something that they call the prototypical school model. So let's use elementary schools as an example for that. According to the prototypical school model, um, an elementary school has 400 students. But if you look at the enrollment of SPS elementary schools, I believe we have maybe two elementary schools that reach or exceed 400 students. So what that means is that the way our schools are currently structured does not match the, foreign, the funding formula. And by default, they are underfunded. So part of getting to a, a well-resourced school is that we have to get to a situation where, where we are at or as close as we can be to 400 students per, that's per elementary school. Um, when we get to that number, that means we can have the funding from the state to cover the full cost of a principal, the full cost of a school nurse, of an art teacher, music teacher. And as an elementary school parent myself, um, you know, I, I think that that would equal a well-resourced school, having all those positions fully funded, full-time, and I think that is what we need to get to. Oh, sorry, and the equity part of that question. Um, <laughs> in regards to that, it begins with the engagement that has been promised by our superintendent and his staff that they are going to be going through, they're gonna be performing the next year to define well-resourced schools with community. Um, if that can be done in an equitable manner, then we increase our odds of having equitably established well-resourced schools. Thank you so much. The Last prepared question before follow-ups this morning will be asked by Shep. Over to you, Shep. Sorry, I was uh, on mute and I couldn't get it off. <laughs> what are your thoughts on addressing the budget deficit? And if necessary, how would you approach deciding which schools to close? Thank you. Um, so just to be clear, our current budget for next year uh, has been proposed balance. A lot of the changes that we're talking about and you're hearing about are things for the 20, was it 24, 25 school year? I can't remember what year we're in. Um, and so when we look at that, we do see that we are facing a $131 million deficit. Um, and that's coming about because of course the decreased enrollment but also because of the loss of our one-time funding that we've used to, to mitigate our way through COVID. That's ESSER funding, one-time funding um, for enrollment loss and transportation. And um, with enrollment projected to keep decreasing, we're talking about making some, you know, we're having to make some substantial changes for the 24-25 school year. And that, as you mentioned, could include, um, I'm gonna say school consolidation because I'm gonna tell you right now that I, as a board director, would never be in favor of or support closing any schools. Um, that is a very 
uh, was disruptive <laughs> decision to make. That would be a very disruptive move. And I think that that would take um, something way more than even just one years of engagement to do. So what we've been saying, and, and I, I want to appreciate the word consolidation, because that is about sharing of resources between schools. That would not be closing schools. There, think about we have we do have some smaller schools that each have their own principal, their own librarian, their own administration, and the idea I think is to combine resources so that both those schools can operate sustainably. And this could, you know, include a model which maintains it should. I'm sorry, it should. It should. It should be a model that maintains the values of community and places our highest priorities at the center. Thank you so much, Lisa. We will now move to follow-ups and I'll put myself somewhere in the queue, but wait to see what other eboard uh, members have follow-up questions for you. These will have a little bit of a shorter window, one minute. So let me see whose hand goes up. Sorry, I don't have my screen across. I don't see anybody's hand up right now. So, oh, Laura Marie. Okay, I'll let you go and then I'll get in behind you, Laura Marie, over to you. Uh, hi, Lisa, and you've had answers to all of these, and the question that I have been asking all of our school board, or actually all of our candidates, what is your, your favorite part of this position, and what is something that maybe the public doesn't know about the school board role? Thank you. A um, favorite part is definitely seeing and being in the company of the students. When I visit schools, that just reminds me why I'm doing it. Because sometimes I'm like, this job is really hard. <laughs> this is a hard, people like to say it's a thankless job. Um, but there are moments of great thanks and, and great just um, reminders of why we're doing it. I said this also in my questionnaire that I was recently at the Seattle School Scholarship Fund uh, ceremony, and I saw what was it, 55 or we, we awarded scholarships about that number of students. There was about maybe 30 in attendance and just seeing them and hearing their stories of what they've overcome and the successes they've gotten through our school system. Just, it, it just makes you want to cry of a little bit of sadness and happiness because these students have struggled so much, but they've achieved so much. And to think that I am part of their ability to do that is, is just all the gift in the world. Something people don't know about us is that we're uh, we're not paid, and so it's a lot of unpaid work. Um, and I, I've actually worked on a position paper with WASDA towards changing that. See what happens. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to jump in and then put Jeremy on the spot. My question to you is: I've really appreciated the thoroughness with which you communicate with families, and I see that journalist come through in your Facebook. I'd love to hear from you some ideas of how actually parents could be mobilizing more effectively, or you know in a way that would be better support your leadership and, and some ideas from that point of view, because I have appreciated the way in which you have reached out to families, consolidated input, and spoken on behalf of families with regards to thorny issues, and, and I would love to see that continue. So any input you have for us as parents of Seattle Public School students. Thank you, and, and I appreciate I appreciate your comments because um, th that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure people are informed, and I think that is the key is is to um, you know look for look for the information. I know I I think that sometimes we put the onus on families to find the information, right? And I want us to be able to bring it to them. And when that happens, I think that there's strength in numbers, and so a lot of you know coordination among school families. When you send in those email um, you know campaigns and things, we we see that, and that does make a difference. So I think that never feel like they're. I want families to feel that their voice is never um, disregarded. That when they write us in. And they contact us, whether it's via phone or social media, um, that we, you know, we're here to listen to that. And that does help us do our job better. And I have very much valued the families that I have built relationships with because some of them contact us more than others. And that's awesome. And some of them I hear from um, time to time. And I, again, I appreciate the effort they make to do that and to be involved in their students' educational experience. Thank you, Lisa. Jeremy, over to you. Um, yeah, you you mentioned your background that you were um, that you've been involved, or were you the chair of? Two, I think you said you were the chair of two PTAs. Um, any anyway, I wanted I wanted to um, ask a little bit about uh, the equity issue around these. Um, I know that um, a lot of the PTAs, especially for you know the schools in your district, <laughs> um, uh, do fund some level of staff. And obviously that 
that causes some equity issues. What have you been doing as a board director and will you do to address the to address uh, that disparity? Thank you. Um, in that you're absolutely right. We have a number of schools, uh, not just in my district, but in, throughout the city, um, primarily on the north end, that do uh, focus a great deal on fundraising. And 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 you can't you know you can't really um, hold that against parents who want to support their students. Um, but ultimately, you know, it is not equitably distributed across our city. And I really appreciated the um, efforts in the South End and now in the North End to create um, kind of third arms that do that work, that are working to work with the school PTAs and um, PTSAs to combine resources and distribute them to schools and with greater need. I think that that's what it's going to take. As, as a director, we can't really tell um, you know, PTAs how to spend their money. That's their own, they're their own independent organizations. They're their own nonprofits and people do what they want with that. Uh, we can really decide whether or not we accept it. And so we see in those efforts, I think encourages me to understand where, you know, that they're, <laughs> that they're working to make this a more equitable system themselves. Thank you, Lisa. Are there more follow-up questions from our e-board? Let me see if I see hands up. Jeremy, back to you. Um, wanted to ask a, another question. Um, you you had brought up uh, that um the that the school board does not have staff on its own, and that the board actually is not even paid. Um, and and that you rely on central staff a lot for, you know, for data um to help back up decisions. How do you um how do you remain independent of um of the central staff because ultimately the school board is responsible for hiring the superintendent. Can you clarify what you mean independent? I just want to make sure I'm uh, just um just if there are cases where just when there are cases where you need to provide oversight on something that central staff or the superintendent is doing, like how do you ensure that the data that you are using is not sort of influenced by their their goals? No, I think in that, in that actually that's, that's hard to do, right? Cause it's, it's a big, it's a big, um, it's a big thing of trust. We need to trust that the staff are doing what they have been trained to do, what they are professionals to do, which is to compile the information, to analyze it, to give us their, uh, again, their educated um, version of what <coughs> options are before us. I think that a lot of times, like I said, building those relationships with staff so that they know us and trust us to give us what we need to make the best decisions we can. Um, what I've also done, and it's kind of enjoyed doing this, is like over the years, I will look at, because a lot of things come to us annually. So I'll take this year's board action report, which explains the item before us, and I'll look at last year's or the years before that, and I'll compare them, and I'll see what's changed, what's different, um, what's exactly the same. <laughs> so basically, like copied over year to year, and try to, you know, give it a bigger, deeper dive and ask questions that, that my experience allowed me to to, to um, have and to um, dive into. Is there another follow-up from our e-board? If I don't see a follow-up question, I will give you the last minute to share any closing thoughts that you would like with us. Over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to just, again, thank you all for your time. Thank the, the families and staff and students of Seattle for being so incredibly resilient and strong through the last four years. Um, the world is a different place than it was four years ago when I first went, ran for this position. And I think that we have all emerged from that just stronger, smarter, braver. And um, again, I, I look forward to giving it another four years with this district and, and doing what I can to keep creating, again, that environment for safe and, and successful students. Thank you so much, Lisa. This will conclude the formal part of our meeting. So we will stop recording.